I'm just waiting for the recording to start. Okay, recording started. Good morning and welcome everybody to the class today on urban church planting. And uh, let's just begin with a word of prayer. Um, let's see. Kanan, is your phone okay? Or uh, are you able to pray? Or yeah, you can hear me. Right? Uh, you can hear me or not? Uh, it's a lot of noise, kind of. Okay, never mind. Never mind. Uh, uh, then I don't know how. I can hear some uh, buzzing sound on back. Yeah, okay. Never mind, Conan. Let's have somebody else pray. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, so Aaron, why don't you pray and then we will start. Sure, Pastor. We pray. Lord, thank you for this day, uh, Lord, uh, for blessing this and every day, Lord. Lord, as we uh, are going to learn about the uh, practical aspect in, about the church planting, Lord, Father, uh, we know that, Lord, Father, it's not easy to start a church. But Lord, Father, if you are with us, Lord, everything is possible. So Lord, Father, I pray for all the students to open up our heart, open up our eyes, Lord, Father, uh, to know, to know your word better, Lord, Father. And Lord, Father, I pray that, Lord, Father, as we journey with this uh, urban church planting, Lord, Father, give us the blueprint and help us uh, to know your timing, Lord, Father. So Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. All right. So thank you for being part of the class. We're going to um, continue from where we paused yesterday. I'm just going to share the PDF for all of us. Okay. So we started talking about some of the practical aspects of church planting or getting a ministry, uh, a Christian ministry started uh, in an urban context, in a, you know, a city, a metropolitan area uh, where there, it, it's complex, where a lot of people are there and so on. So I'm just, we're just going through some, you know, different things to think about. So first thing we spoke yesterday was about the, and uh, the core team, the importance of having a group of people who are like-minded, who are committed, uh, who will be able to work towards uh, you know, establishing a new church or um, the ministry that, uh, you, uh, that you're designed to start in uh, the city. Then we talked about preparing from a distance where you know, even before you actually get on the ground, you can start preparing. And something I would encourage each of you to start thinking about even in your own, uh, for your own ministry, you know, like we said, next year you're going to be graduating. Uh, and so it's good to start thinking, uh, you know, what are you going to do? And if, if the Lord is leading you uh, to go to a city, or go to some place and start a ministry, it's good to start preparing even from a distance, you know, start thinking about it, uh, doing the research, like we said, writing down, praying about it, writing down what God is speaking to you. And, uh, and and prepare from a distance. And uh, the, the the third point that we covered yesterday, where we stopped, was about relocating to be on site. So at, at the right timing, uh, you move into that place, or you move into that ministry that uh, God is uh, leading you to do. You know, to plant the church or to start uh, the Christian work there, right? And then. Uh, uh, so uh, as part of that, you know, you, you begin to go about doing the survey phase and the preparation, the launch phase, which we will be talking about. All right. So we're going to go move forward from there and, you know, feel free to ask questions anytime or even type your questions in the chat and we will take it up. We'll try to keep some time 
uh, for questions um, before we close today. So um, another important part, uh, especially for those of us who are starting out in uh, church planting or starting out uh, uh, a new ministry in the city, uh, the very important question is about finances. You know, how are we going to get the money to do this? Now, uh, there are several options. If you are being sent by a church uh, to go and start, to go and plant a church, very often your the, the mother church, so to speak, or the church that is sending you uh, will help you financially, at least for a period of time to get started and so on. So that that happens in some cases where uh, uh, the, the sending church will, you know, uh, uh, will, will support you um, and, uh, and uh, um, or uh, in some cases, people use their own fin personal finances to, if they ha already have had some savings, they will do that. They'll use their own money to go and get a church started or a ministry started. Uh, but in addition to that, which is which is an option, the finances can come from the sending church. Personal finances, you know, uh, I, I want you, I want us to be open to the idea that some you may sometimes you may work for a period of time, so you may work professionally for a period of time while you are in parallel planting the church. So maybe some of the team members, let's say if two or three people are going or three families are going, uh, they may say, and they may discuss and say, okay, you know, for, for the initial period, we, each, each one of us will have a job, we will work, and then, you know, we will take care of our families, and then we will also start the church. And maybe, you know, at some point of the church is, has enough finances to pay, the, pay for uh, the people, then, you know, people can transition to becoming salaried staff, so on. So there is nothing wrong in taking this approach. I, and like I mentioned yesterday, we see in scripture that even the apostle Paul and his team members in different cities, at Corinth, at Ephesus, at Thessalonica, uh, they worked, and uh, what we can understand from scripture is they were tent makers. They actually made tents and they sold the tents in, to people. So uh, they made tents, they sold them, they earned money, and uh, it took care of their own personal needs, the needs of the team members, uh, while they worked at the same time in planting or establishing a church in a city. So that is an option. But we have to admit that uh, it is a challenging option. It's not uh, very easy. And, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, at some point you can decide to transition from working professionally into, you know, focusing full time on the church and the ministry. Or uh, in some cases, people continue to work professionally, uh, you know, and they have other people who will serve full time in the church plan. That is also an option. So uh, the, the important thing is to know what has God called you to do. Hey, what has God called you? How does God want you uh, to organize the finances for the work you are doing? There is no set way. There is no, it's not like there's only one way you can do it. There are many, many options, but you need to think about this and you need to, um, uh, you know, do what God wants you to do. You don't have to necessarily uh, copy somebody else, you know, if, just do it the way God wants you to do it, right? Whatever you feel in your heart to do. Uh, I, I can speak for our own selves. You know, when we were leaving the U.S. and moving back to India to uh, start the church here in Bangalore, there was many, many options. A lot of people were giving us, uh, you know, different people, I would say, sorry, different people are giving us different kinds of advice on how to go about it. Uh, some people are saying, you know, why don't you become citizens? Why did you get green card? Why did you become citizens in America? And then you go, you travel to India, you do the work and come back. So some people were talking about that kind of an option. But uh, 
uh, then there was someone else who uh, introduced us to a very large church and uh, that church was willing to fund us um, uh, with a certain amount. Uh, but then we would become uh, uh, missionaries of that church, which was an option, uh, you know, and, and so on. But then in our hearts, one of the things we felt was we, when we come to India, when we do our work in India, we want to do it as a purely indigenous work. Because, you know, through the years I had seen in India a problem. The problem was people had, a, had the, um, the wrong notion that if you're going to start a work, you need money from outside India. Or if you're going to, you know, do ministry, you had to be funded from outside India. People had the wrong idea. So in my heart, I felt, look, I want my life to be an example. Uh, uh, through my example, I, I want to make it clear to people, we don't have to depend on money from outside India to do the work in India, right? So even though there were these options, you know, we had a big church in, in the US who were willing to make us their missionaries and fund us, take care of us. Everything. We said politely, we said, thank you very much, but you know, this is not what God's calling us to do. So we declined their offer. The other idea about, you know, staying in America, getting your green card, we declined that. We said, no, we are just going to India. I mean, we want to do an indigenous work. So when we came back to India, uh, the plan was, I will work professionally for the initial period of time, as long as I felt I needed to do it and simultaneously start the church. So that's what we did. So when I came back, of course, because of, uh, uh, you know, God just orchestrating things, I was able to start a business. Uh, so I, I wasn't working for anybody else. I had my own. And of course, I started with just one person myself. Uh, I was just doing software development work. And uh, at the same time, we started the church. And so we did like did it like that for 14 years. So from... 13 years, I guess, from 2001 to 2014. That's how it went. Uh, we, were, uh, we were doing the church work at the same time doing the business. Now, uh, things are growing, you know, now. Uh, and I could say, looking back at those 13 years, it was not easy. There was a lot of tension, both sides, uh, the business side, because, you know, I was running my own company, which means I was accountable to all the customers and, you know, all those things, a lot of work pressure. Uh, and then at the same time, there was the church. And the church was also slowly and steadily growing. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of, uh, it was a lot to handle. Uh, and then uh, in 2014 is when I transitioned fully to focus on the church. But it also had a lot of advantages. Uh, the advantage was, of course, money. Especially in the early years, we were able to put a lot of money into the church from the business to get things started. So that, that was a big advantage. Um, the other advantage was and I could manage my own time. So if I needed to, you know, take a day to focus completely on church work, I could do it. Uh, you know, in the same office space, I would spend time handling business and then uh, I, I could, you know, take an hour off to meet with people or do any kind of church work. So uh, it, it gave a, that kind of flexibility. Uh, which was very, very good, very advantageous. So uh, there were the benefits of doing that kind of work. Anyway, I'm just sharing that personal testimony just to show you that, look, uh, there are many different ways that you can go about this and you feel you do what God is leading you to do. The only thing I would definitely say is uh, be very, very careful if you're also working because you can easily get pulled into that and forget about the main cause, which is the church plant or the ministry you're starting. If you're not a person who can balance, you know how to you know, manage things well, then don't do it. Just focus on the church work. Because I know uh, of cases where you know people start out saying, okay, I will do both. And they just get fully caught up in the business side or in the work side and they forget about they just cannot handle doing the church side or the ministry side. And so then not, it doesn't take off. So 
if you're not able to manage it, then don't get involved in the work at all. Just concentrate on the church, uh, plan to focus only on the church and, you know, just work on that along those lines. So um, I, I would just, you know, say you need to do what God needs you to do. God leads you to do as far as this area of finances is concerned. But please think about it, have a clear plan and go on. The other thing also you need to keep in mind, and we will talk more about this in the last section, is there, there are other personal needs. Uh, there are, of course, the needs of uh, family members, and there may be special needs, uh, you know, uh, family members who, who might be, if they're coming with you, um, uh, there may be, uh, you know, in the workplace, if you're employed or self-employed, this, this is a big difference. If you employ an organization, then, you know, you have to give those eight to 10 hours to the employer. Uh, you cannot use that time to do ministry. Whereas if you're self-employed, you you know, you're more flexible. Uh, you have to think about schooling for children, you know, that, that is an expense. Then you need to think about all those things. So when you're looking ahead, you're planning, keep these things in mind, uh, you know, family members, your workplace, your schooling, think through all these things before you go ahead and get started. Another important thing is uh, as part of the preparation uh, is uh, to plan for the legal, the administrative and regulatory mat matters. You see, even though, so you're going to go start a church or you're going to start a Christian ministry at some point, you will have to create it as a legal entity. And this we are, we are talking about this in the other course that we're doing on uh, uh, church administry, administration, that you will have to form it as a legal entity. Uh, you, know, you can't just run it as a home church for a long time. I mean, if, if you want to do a home church with few people, okay. But if you, you know, want a growing church with lots of people or a growing ministry that's going to rent space and, you know, have a lot of things. Uh, it has to be a legal entity. You will have to, you know, have other things in place like banking, finance, um, local government regulations, filing the professional tax, income tax, all those kinds of things. So uh, it's good to just become familiar with this. Okay, how are you going to handle it uh, when you go into a city? You know, you, it's very uh, the best thing to do is to find uh, a good um, accountant and a legal person who can help you, can do this work for you, you know. So it's good to uh, get their help and say, you know, please help us in registering the church or the ministry um, and uh, helping us with the accounting and other uh, regulatory matters. So that's the best thing to do. So when you go into a city, go somewhere, get the help of a good um, accountant or, you know, if you have a believer who's an accountant, he will understand these things and will be able to help you. But think about it and prepare for it even before you start, okay? Uh, let me pause here. Any questions before I jump into uh, the next uh, topic? Any questions so far? Okay. Um, so, uh, let's just move forward. I don't, don't see any questions. So once you um, once you come into you know so you've you've done this in, initial preparation. You got your team. You got your uh, all these things we've spoken about, and you come into the place where you're going to start. Uh, take time to survey the place, right? Take time to, um, let me see, I don't know, I thought I heard a, heard a question. Uh, let me go back here. Yes, Dave, what's your question, please? It's not the question, sir. Uh, actually, Siddharth is waiting to uh, come in, so I... Oh. Sorry. Okay, sure. You can come in. Yeah, because um, if I'm on the 
PDF, this auto admin feature doesn't work. Anyway, let's wait. Okay. So uh, while we, I'll just wait a minute or two before I switch to the PDF. Um, so what I was saying is, so once you're on the ground, it is useful to survey the place physically. Now you may even do the survey phase a little earlier, like you make one visit or two visits, survey the place, do all the preparation and then come, then officially launch. So, you know, um, there is no set way of how you would survey the place. One of the things we do tell our Bible college students, especially if they are uh, planning to start a ministry in uh, their own, uh, you know, in a certain area, a certain place, uh, we tell them, you know, during this final year, go and survey that place. Meaning look at it uh, with, you know, with these guidelines that we're telling you about. You know, think about, just go about that place. And I, I will share some guidelines. What are some of the things you need to look for uh, while you are surveying uh, the area, surveying the place where you're going to start the work, right? So uh, I, I will I, I will share with you a little survey that was that was done for Bangalore City. Um, I will upload that into the um, coursework thing so you get an idea of what a survey looks like. Um, uh, so let me just uh, go back to the PDF. So take time to survey the city. So uh, basically trying to understand at, at a physical level, uh, you know, what is happening in the city. Now, but many interesting things can happen, you know, during your survey phase. For instance, if you go to Acts 16, let's read that because I think that's a very interesting passage. Acts 16, uh, 11 to 15, can somebody, uh, read that for us. Acts 16, 11 to 15, please. Acts 16, 11 through 15. Therefore, losing from Troas, we came with a, with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from thanks to Philip, which is the chief city of the part of Macedonia and a colony. And we went in the city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spoke unto the woman who resorted writer. And a certain woman named Lydia, a sailor, a purple of city of Theatria, Theatria, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she Constraint us. Mm. Okay. Thank you. So it's kind of interesting. See, so when Paul and uh, Paul and Silas, and they, uh, along with Luke, so they came, they crossed, uh, you know, they went out from, this was like they're crossing over into Europe. You know, it's uh, so they, 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 uh, they go across the Aegean Sea, they come into this whole district of Macedonia, and the first city they go to is Philip. Hi. So it's very interesting, you know, uh, it says in verse 12, so once they reached Philippi, they just, they were staying in the city certain days, for some days. So we don't know, you know, whether it's three days, five days, or how many days it was, but they were just soaking in the city, so to speak. You know, they were in the city, going around, just soaking in what's happening. So you can say in some way, they were surveying the city. They were getting a feel of that city. They were in that city for certain days. And then verse 13 says, on the Sabbath day, they went out of the city. Now, why do they go out of the city? Because they would have heard, hey, on the Sabbath day, there's a prayer meeting that's happening by the riverside. You know, so uh, although it doesn't state here, 
I'm just, uh, you know, trying to infer certain things from this passage. Paul and his team, they must have, you know, spoken to people in the city. Uh, you know, is there any prayer happening? What's going on? Then they mentioned hey, every Sabbath day, you go by the river. There's a, there are people who pray there. So he says on verse 13, on the Sabbath day, they intentionally they went out of the city. They went to the riverside uh, where they, you know, where they met this group that was meeting there for prayer. It was a women's group and uh, they were meeting by the riverside for prayer. And so they, you know, Paul and uh, Silas and Luke and who uh, Timothy, I think, was with them at this time as well. Uh, so, you know, you can imagine these four men, they meet these ladies, women's group. <laughs> it's a very unusual thing. Men attending a women's prayer meeting. But uh, they introduce themselves and they get to meet this, this, this leader of this group, Lydia. And so obviously uh, they uh, take the time to share the gospel with her. And it says in verse 14, the Lord opened her heart. So you can see, you know, uh, through their surveying, just moving around in the city, God has set up a connection. God has set up somebody in that city who would receive them, who would welcome them, uh, with whom they could share the gospel. And so this woman, Lydia, she is baptized. That means she has received the message of Jesus Christ and she's baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So while they were already a prayerful group, now they have become a believing group, a group of people who believed in Jesus. And, uh, you know, and from then on the ministry uh, begins. So notice they didn't meet Lydia on the first day they arrived at Philippi. You know, now sometimes God does that. He may supernaturally orchestrate a meeting on the very first day. Sometimes he lets us lets you do the survey part. Just go around the city, get a feel of the city, go out and meet some people in the city, uh, and then he opens somebody's heart. And that's what happened in this case. Right? So I think it's a beautiful example of uh, you know of just getting a feel of the city, of getting a feel of the part of the city where you're going to do the ministry just just being there just meeting the people getting to know the people and in the process god can open up somebody's heart uh, he can open up a door of opportunity uh, the same thing happens in athens uh, again it's a very interesting passage to read in Acts 17 verses 16 to 23 uh, you know uh, uh, i know it's a rather lengthy passage but uh, maybe let's just read uh, verses 16 and 17 just two verses acts the 17th chapter verses 16 and 17 somebody could read that please it's now while paul waited for waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked Within him, when he saw that the city was given over to the over to idols, therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the with the Gentile worshippers, and in the marketplace dealt with those who happened to the happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers countered him, and some said, "What does this new babbler want to say?" Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Mm, thank you. So, you know, Paul comes to Athens. Uh, and like uh, we've said earlier, Athens was an intellectual capital. You know, it was a, it was a, it was a, a great pla a place where many of these great Greek philosophers had come out of. And, so this was a you know, a place where people like to hear and discuss things. And Paul goes, you know, he goes into the marketplace. Notice verse 17. He comes to the marketplace every day. So what's he doing? He's, you know, he's there in Athens. He's trying to get a feel of the city, right? He's seeing what's going on in the city. He sees the city, oh, a lot of idolatry is going happening here. Uh, the city is given to idols. Then he comes to the marketplace. He sees uh, 
people worshipping. He sees the Jews in the synagogue. And he also runs into these philosophers, verse 18, people who like to discuss things. So, you know, Paul is just moving in the city. He's getting a feel. Okay, he's, you know, and, 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 and uh, uh, of course, Luke is with him. And so Luke is, uh, uh, or maybe Luke is not there as yet. So they're, they're on their way. Uh, Silas, Timothy are on their way. And, uh, 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 Luke is just report, reporting this, what happened. So Paul is uh, getting a feel of the city and uh, he's realizing, you know, there's, there's a lot of idolatry here. Oh, there are some Jews here. They worship in the synagogue. There are Gentile worshipers who are also joining them. And then there are all these philosophers who like to discuss things. And so, and then he starts engaging with these philosophers. And, you know, and through that discussion with them, they invite him. They eventually get him a hearing at Eropagus, which is the on Mars Hill, which is, you know, the, the intellectuals in that city. So that's how the work gets started uh, in Athens. But in both these examples, you know, we see how Paul went about things. Like when he comes into a new city, he takes the time to get a feel of the city, to survey the city. And so uh, it, it is just a good model to follow. I'm not saying this is the rule and everything has to happen like this, but I'm just saying, you know, here are some guidelines. Here are some ways to go about starting a work in a city. You know, get a, do the survey, get a feel of the city. Another important thing, so the next thing is this, is you need to select the launch area, meaning the place where you're going to start the work. Right? Now, uh, if it's a church plant or if it's a ministry, you know, uh, where are you going to begin the launch? Right uh, now, you may be able to identify this before you even get into the city. Like you know, maybe you're doing a survey through Google Maps, and you say, "Well, you know, I, I am starting a youth ministry, so I want to be near some colleges." And so you may find an area where there are you know three or four colleges. It's okay, that's a good place to start. Why? Uh, because uh, there are colleges there, and I'm, I'm trying to reach the youth. You know, so like this, you you could. You, you could identify this launch area even before you come to the city or when you are on site and you're surveying the city, uh, you know, based on the information you find, you can make your decision or sometimes God may just direct you to a particular area where you should start your work, right? So uh, whatever it is, you know, your goal is to impact the city or your goal is to impact that part of the city. And, uh, you know, you could eventually reach out to the whole city uh, but uh, be sensitive to um, uh, to what God is leading you to do. Uh, some other guidelines we give you is uh, be sensitive to what God is already doing in the city. Uh, don't do anything that would adversely affect other ministries that are already working in the city. You know, so if possible, avoid an area that already has a church or many churches. At least there's got to be something different about you and other churches working. Maybe it's a language difference. You know, if there are uh, regional language churches in that area and you're studying an English language, okay, it's fine. But don't get it, go, don't do something that competes with some other church in the same area. So be a little sensitive to those kinds of things. You know, and uh, like we also said, a good thing to do when you're about to start a ministry or a church in a city is to go meet some of the past and, past and leaders uh, of existing churches and Christian organizations, uh, introduce yourself, build friendships with them, share with them your plan, uh, you know, see if you can learn something from them and also you know, dispel any fear of uh, competition or st sheep stealing, you know, just let them know. Look, I'm here. We're not to I'm here not to compete with you. I'm just here to, you know, bless the city and do what God's called me to do. So, all these things can be done when you are strategically deciding which part of the city to start the church. Right. So be sensitive. And, and just in, in our own experience, when we came to Bangalore, like I said. Uh, I went around looking, you know, so we came here in December, end of December uh, 2000. 
so the latter part of December, early part of January, I went around looking in Bangalore, you know, where, to find a place to start. Where should I start? And uh, I, I really couldn't find anything, you know, and I didn't know enough uh, about the city and things like that. So I remember towards the latter part of January, I was praying. I said, God, you know, I've, uh, I really don't know how, how we're going to start. You know, I've gone and seen all these places and uh, how do I start? And based on the adv advice given to me by other pastors, I went to those areas where they said, you know, you should start. And I went and looked. I couldn't find a place. But um, what do I do? And I remember, you know, God just spoke to me one, one morning as I was praying. He just said, start with what you have. And I said, oh, start with what I have. What do I have? Well, at that point, we were living in my father's house, my dad's house, uh, in a certain part of Bangalore. And uh, I said, okay, just start at home. Fine. So I went and asked my dad. I said, would it be okay if we just start right here in our home? Now, I didn't tell him God told me to say, God told me, start with what you have. I didn't say that. You know, I was acting upon what I knew God had put in my heart, but I need to, you know, just talk to him. And he said, yeah, perfectly fine. You can start here. So that's how we started. We just started in the living room of our, my father's, my dad's house with a very small group, about 12 people or so were there. That's how we started. Uh, but then we did some work. You know, we were, initially I looked around many places. I couldn't. At that point, I didn't, because I didn't know much about the city, I I couldn't, uh, you know, find a suitable place. So we just started at home. Uh, we went around in, in the neighborhood inviting people, and we started like that. But one of the things we, we made very sure throughout our journey was not to position our congregation close to another church. Uh, where there, there would be any conflict, you know, we, we want to be in a place where uh, even if there is another church in the same area, there's a difference, meaning that may be a different denomination or it may be a different language church. So there is no, you know, conflict um, between them, people who go there and people who would come to the work we're doing. So be a little sensitive uh, in these things. And when you're looking at where you are going to start your work, right? So once you've decided on your launch area, spend some time understanding it. So even uh, and when we started, this was long, 20 years ago, uh, you know, we went house to house, we put flyers. And of, of course, I knew that my, my immediate area a little bit. Um, so I, I knew, okay, this predominantly uh, uh, a non-Christian area. There not, there's nothing much happening in terms of Christian work. Uh, so we just had to go house to house, inviting people, so on. So uh, do some work in your launch area. Uh, some of the things that you know you would think about is uh, you know see where are the schools, where are the colleges, uh, where are the malls, where are the pubs, where are the coffee shops, what are the other NGOs that are working, what are the businesses that are there. You know, because all of this would give you uh, a thought on, you know, where are the places you could evangelize, where are the places you could reach out to people and so on. So you have a general idea about uh, the, the area in which you're going to be doing your work, right? This is the, your launch area. And of course, as, as, as the work grows, you will be reaching much more uh, in the city, right? Uh, keep, an, keep also in mind the kind of people you want to reach. Uh, keep in mind the demographics. That means, uh, are you reaching young people? Well, uh, would, would these young people have their own transport or would they be dependent on public transport? If they're depend going to be dependent on public transport, then it's good to find a place where it's easily accessible to public transport. If they're going to bring using their own transport, is there enough parking for them? You know, Can they park their vehicles? So you'd think along those lines. If you're if you're going to you know you're thinking about a place where you're going to have worship, so think about all those things. You know, in the place where we're going to have worship, are we going to be a nuisance to our neighbors? You know, if we, if you make a lot of noise when we sing, is it going to be disturbing others? So even when we started in our, our living room, we were there for a very short time. Then very quickly we moved to 
a, a rented space in kind of a resort nearby. They had an op open space. So, you know, we moved the congregation there. So we were not disturbing anybody. So you have to be sensitive to these kinds of things as, um, as you decide on the launch phase. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? Let me just pause and see. Any questions? Okay. Any questions, anybody? Okay, you're falling so far. Okay, and some of you uh, may understand from your experience as well. Uh, you know, most of these things that we're talking about. All right, so. So once you've you've gone through the launch phase, let us start off on the pre preparation phase. I know we have less than ten minutes, but let's just do some of these things. So, uh, part of the preparation. So you've 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 decided on your launch area, your launch site, where you're going to get started. Then you're thinking about the preparation. What are some of the things you need to do before you start? Right. So sometimes some people have pre-launch meetings. Now we. Uh, you know, only I would say only in uh, you know when we when we started the work in Malaysia, which is the east part of Bangalore, did we do pre-launch meetings? But in all the other situations, we just started. But this is becoming a trend, and so I'm just sharing that with you is that many people do uh, pre-launch meetings. That means uh, in the area where they are, uh, uh, they want to start the work. Uh, they may have some initial outreaches or meetings or seminars or, or uh, different things that engage with the community before they officially launch. So we call them as pre-launch meetings. So sometimes they may have, you know, uh, prayer meetings. Sometimes they may just have times of worship, you know, things like that. And, 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 I, and I have you know, observed that uh, these pre-launch meetings can happen from three months to six months. And uh, I know one one team that did pre-launch, I think, for one year or so. So it really depends. There's no set things. But so that means before they officially launch, they're just, you know, getting to inter, inter, um, inter, interact with people uh, in some informal ways without calling themselves a church or a ministry. They're just doing some initial things. You know, uh, it could be, you know, breakfast meetings, lunch meetings, uh, uh, different things. You know, people can think of maybe they have a series of movies and they could do a series of um, uh, worship evenings, prayer meetings, different things. But these are just things they're doing in that area as a pre-launch. Uh, and uh, uh, people would spend time in worship and prayer during the pre-launch meeting. So, you know, some groups were just, okay, we're just going to spend the next six months just worship and prayer in this area before we officially start. Or they say, they might say, okay, our team is going to just spend one year, the next one year, next 12 months, and before we start the church, we're just going to be here in, in worship and prayer uh, as a pre-launch. And, you know, during that process, they will meet with people, they will connect with people and so on. So this is uh, something that could be done uh, again, it's not mandatory, but just uh, an idea if the Lord leads you to do that. Uh, also, as part of your uh, preparation, uh, as I mentioned, identify your primary target audience and then the other extended audience. So, example, uh, are you reaching young English-speaking professionals? Are you? Uh, does it include young English-speaking married couples? You know, what age range? You know, looking from 18 to 35, that would be a core. It doesn't mean you're not going to reach others, but this would be a main core. So if that's going to be a core, then you need to know their needs. What are their needs? How will you connect with them? And, uh, you know, how would you relate to them? You know, what are the ways you can serve them? So, for example, when APC started, when we started, our, our target audience was young working professionals. So uh, English speaking, working professionals in the city. Uh, we, we, you know, God always gives us a grace to reach certain people, you know, whoever. You know, some people may, may be sent to work with those who are in slums. Some people may be sent to work with children, or some maybe even with destitute children, orphan children. Some may be with uh, 
a certain language group. You know, you work with people who speak a certain language. So it doesn't matter, you know, uh, how, um, uh, what group God sends you to. You need to understand your target audience, right? Uh, because the kinds of ministries you do should serve your target audience. No point in saying, oh, I'm reaching young professionals. But, you know, the ministry you're doing actually is meant for some other language group. Uh, then there's a disconnect. You won't be able to reach your target audience. Okay. Uh, I, I, I will share more uh, about this and uh, how, you know, how this will affect, uh, you know, what we do uh, next, next, uh, next week. Okay. But uh, understand, study your target audience. And I'll share some more thoughts on that. Uh, we're going to pause here today and uh, we will take a few moments. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, let's um, close in prayer and I will pick up on the same point, uh, the target audience uh, next week and uh, give some further thoughts on that, okay? Um, let's wrap up in prayer. Um, yeah. Who wants to pray? Um, all right, I'm just trying to pick somebody. Dave, why didn't you close in prayer, please? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you are our God. You are so merciful. You are so great. Thank you, Father, for your love. Thank you, Father, for your grace. And thank you, Father, for this day and for the class that we have been through, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you you are with us. You have been so faithful and you have always been there for us, Lord Jesus, as you learn, Lord God, uh, the start, start planting and Lord, as you learn it, Lord Jesus, help each one of us to uh, visualize where you want us to um, work for your kingdom, Lord Jesus. Give us that vision, Lord God, and give, uh, help each one of us to have that uh, complete vision so that we can, we, can, we can do what you want us to do, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the class. Thank you, Father, for pastor, and thank you, Father, for everyone, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Um, be with us throughout the day. And we thank you once again, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Mm -hmm. Enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you again soon. Thank you.